Hello, everyone. Um, I just wanted to come on just to give the introduction. Thank you guys for coming in and joining us today. Um, this is the second day. Oh, there's our special guest. Um, this is, I just want to thank you guys for joining. This is part two of our lecture series. Um, if you don't know me or see me around campus, my name is Deanna Hewlett, uh, and I'm the recreation coordinator here at Manhattan College. I will be moderating um, along with three other ladies, uh, Alexa Schmidt, Jimmy Perez, and Sydney Harwood. Uh, I'm now going to ask you to introduce yourself, and we'll start with them. Hi, I'm Alexa Schmidt. Um, I'm a senior, and I'm on the women's rowing team. Hi, Abby. So nice of you to be here. I'm kind of fan girl, I'm not going to lie. Um, my name is Gemma Perez. I'm a senior as well, and I'm on the women's soccer team. Hi, and thank you so much, ladies. Um, now I want to introduce... I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I'm so sorry, Sydney. I'm so no, sorry. No, 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 no. Um, I'm Sydney Harwood. I'm also on the women's soccer team, and I'm also fangirling very hard. <laughs> thank you for being here. <laughs> well, thank you so much, ladies. Sorry, I, I didn't mean to get over you. So, um, but now I want to introduce our two time Olympic gold medalist, FIFA World Cup champion, and New York Times bestselling author, Abby Wamba. Uh, Abby, we want to thank you coming tonight. We are super excited to hear from you. Uh, so if you don't mind just giving us an introduction about yourself, letting us know some things that we may not know about you. Tell us how 2020 is treating you, how retirement is treating you, you know, all that good stuff. Awesome. Uh, well, first of all, thanks for having me. <clears throat> I apologize for being a little late. I had the wrong link. Uh, we can always blame my agents for that. If you don't know me, my name is Abby Wambach, and I used to play on the United States women's soccer team for 15 years. Um, many of those years, I uh, was the captain, and I was able to win a couple of gold medals and a World Cup championship. Um, and it's interesting because, you know, shortly after I retired, um, not to toot my own horn, but I am the speaker here, so I guess I get to do that with y'all. Uh, ESPN called and they actually wanted to offer and give me, along with two other athletes, what's called the SB Icon Award. Um, and if you don't know what the SBs are, the SBs are essentially like the Oscars, but for sports. So it's this one night that the show is nationally televised or pre-COVID nationally televised show. Um, and they wanted to give me this Icon Award uh, along with Peyton Manning and Kobe, Kobe Bryant. May he rest in peace. And I remember you know, when they called and, and, and told me about this honor, I was just like, holy beep. I was like, are you kidding me? Like, this is Kobe and Peyton. Like, everybody knows these guys. And they're putting me on the same stage, getting the same award. Uh, wow, right? So fast forward to finding myself literally on the stage and um, getting this award. And I'm just feeling so overwhelmed with gratitude often the only emotion women are allowed. And uh, the lights turn off, we get our award, I nailed my lines, thank gosh. Uh, and the three of us turned to walk off stage and what was supposed to be like the best night of my life, I was supposed to party with all the athletes and all the, the celebrities, um, ended up finishing off totally different, right? I realized in that moment, not only that my career was really over, um, but that the three of us were walking into very different retirements, right? Kobe and, and Peyton's biggest concerns were where they, where they were going to invest their hundreds of millions of dollars that they collectively earned. And mine, and this is a true story, um, was how the hell I was going to pay my mortgage. Like what job was I going to now learn how to do to be able to afford living life um, month to month? Um, and so I got into my car and I went back to my hotel room and I had like one of those Jerry Maguire moments. Um, and I don't even know you guys might be too young for Jerry Maguire reference, but it's a, a movie that Tom Cruise starred in long ago. Um, and essentially I tried to figure out what the hell happened. Like, how did I live a whole career? Cause as a national team player, you know, I fancied myself. I was like, I represented the U S I was like one of 300 plus million people, um, 
playing in the Olympics and, and playing in World Cups and doing some pretty cool stuff. And what did I really have to show for it? So I promised myself two things that night. One, that I was going to do everything in my power to make sure that the next big player, Alex Morgan, Megan Rapino, Crystal Dunn's, of the US national team wouldn't share this experience with me. And then number two, if this was happening to me, I realized that because I fancied myself that this was happening to every woman in every industry, in every city, in every state, in every country around the world. So something had to change. And and from that moment on, I dedicated myself to really truly fighting for equality, not just pay equity, but true equality um, from top to bottom. Uh, and that kind of gave me, it, it was a, it was a beautiful moment, very hard to swallow in the, in the moment, but a beautiful moment for me because it gave me my, my purpose post, post, post career, um, you know, and as a national team player, I learned some valuable lessons as a, as a player and as a teammate. Uh, and so many people ask me the, the question of like, what do you miss the most about playing? And I'm just like, Truthfully, I don't miss playing at all. It was hard. Like running around for 90 minutes is hard as hell. Um, I miss the people. And the people are what make the experience and the environment so special. And when you watch the women's national team play, if you've ever had a moment and you've ever watched them play, there's something intoxicating about it. I, I now understand it from a fan's perspective. And it's because these women have taken uh, some of these culturally and, and constructed ideas of what it means to be a woman. And literally these, these women all collectively throw those ideas out and create their own way in their own environment. Um, and when you're in that environment, you don't know how good you've got it, right? So, so for me in my, my retirement, my job for my life uh, is not just to, to fulfill this purpose of equality, but to truly try to create these environments and these um, wolf packs of women everywhere so that they can, they too can understand and experience that bond, that being with people who see things the way you see things and don't believe necessarily in everything that you believe in, but are fighting for a common goal. That for me was the most special part about being on the national team. And it's the thing that I am trying to continually create and, and recreate in every room that I walk into. Um, I'm always attracted to the people who are ambitious, especially women, always attracted to the people who are trying to change um, the world for, for progress sake, right? And, and to make the world better and more equal for every living being on this planet. Um, and by the way, it's not like an easy job. It's like I'm bashing my head against the wall 95% of the time, but those 5% where I feel like I am making progress and I am having an impact um, is amazing. And, you know, I just am so grateful that I did have the time to learn all that I did uh, on the national team. And we'll talk a lot about some of the stuff that I wrote uh, in a book that was released in 2018. It's called Wolfpack. Um, uh, actually, it released in 2019. <laughs> this year has been so weird. I'm like losing time. Um, and, you know, I'm just, I'm just really amazed at not just the colleges that want me to speak to their students, um, but companies and corporations that actually find that there is such a connection between human beings and sport and corporate world and women athletes and what we know and what we see and what we can contribute. Um, so, yeah, that's a little bit about me. My 2020 has been so bizarre, like I'm sure every single person on this call. Um, I haven't gotten on a plane in over six months, and that hasn't happened since I was like 12 years old. Um, I've been traveling since I was a little kid playing soccer and fulfilling that dream for a long time. Um, and it's just been super weird, and I'm sure you guys all feel the same way, especially right now being in college. Um, I'm just sorry that, that this is happening during your college time, but I'm sure you guys are making the best of it. And, you know, this is a Q&A, and I just want you guys to understand and know you can ask me anything, literally anything. Um, I am not only an open book, but, like, I really do want you all to get something out of this. Um, so 
I don't know, I think, Deanna, are you gonna run moderation here? Uh, yes, yeah, so it'll be myself, um, Alexa, Sydney, and Gemma. Uh, so I'm actually going to allow the girls to kind of do their thing. Um, yeah, let's go. For everyone, um, if you have any questions, we're gonna first allow Alexa, Sydney, and Gemma to ask their questions. But as she's speaking, if you come up with any questions, please put it in the chat and we'll have time when they're done. I'll go through and we'll ask the questions um, in the chat. So cool. uh, we'll start with Alexa. Well, take it away. I just want to thank you again for coming. I'm like really feeling girling right now. I, I'm very nervous, but I'm so excited that you're here. Um, this is like a like a literal childhood dream. Um, I'm just going to fangirl for like one more second. I was at the game um, in June 20th, 2013, when you broke the international record. Um, I actually have a picture of it. Are you uh, serious? You were really at that game? I, it was at Red Bull Stadium. I yeah. just turned 14 like four days ago <laughs> uh, so I, I was like holy crap I was like no way I just witnessed history I'm frantically scrolling on my phone to try and get the picture right now but I want to show you because like you've inspired so many girls and you know you started with my 14 year old self and here she oh is oh my gosh look so, at you <laughs> yes, <true>. um <laughs> The first question that I have is um, in your book, Wolfpack, which is an amazing book, um, you give great advice and you talk about women's empowerment. Um, who would you say inspires you and encourages you to be who you truly are? I think this is a really important question. You know, a lot of people think about it. I get this question a lot and I think I would categorize it into phases of my life and periods of time in my life. Obviously when I was a kid, you know, your parents are like very involved with your life, but I had six older brothers and sisters and then two cousins that lived with us. Um, so they were very impactful for me. And why I would say that is because as an athlete, you're always observing other people because there's a comparative nature to playing sport. Um, you're, you're comparing yourself to the person next to you, which is not always the greatest thing, but that's just the nature of the beast, right? Um, you're comparing yourself to yourself. And I learned from a very young age from my family members, like what they did well and what worked for them and then also what they didn't do good, right? Um, and being the youngest, I watched them all play sports. I watched them all do different kinds of sports. Um, I happened to be super athletic and that helped me kind of progress in my athleticism. And I was also, also always playing against like older people because they were just older than, than me. And then uh, somebody, my high school soccer coach and basketball coach was a really important person in my life, in my development, because it was the first time somebody really pushed me, uh, pushed my buttons. She pissed me off. She kicked me out of practice. She made me humble. And um, she made me truly understand the, the dynamic and the importance of not just being the best player, but, but being a team player. Um, I was always scoring more goals than everybody else. I was always scoring more points. I was always the one that was in the paper. Um, and she would just always tell me constantly, you're never gonna win championships if all the attention is only on you. So that, that in, in, that gave me the understanding of whenever I did interviews, I wanted to talk about my teammates. Um, it gave me this other mindedness thought process. Um, and truly it, I, 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 I was a forever changed player person because of it. So I gave my coach Kathy Bouton quite a bit of credit for that. And she rode me pretty hard too. So I, I respect her a lot. She didn't just, take it easy on me because I was the best player. Uh, she made me better. And then as I get older, right, I had this beautiful environment to play against some of the most talented athletes in the world. Uh, and then some of them, you know, were difficult personality wise. Um, some of them were brilliant in certain ways, the best in the world at their craft, whether it was scoring or goalkeeping or whatever. Um, and just being in that environment where you have 23 like type A bad women who are always trying to like make gains and get better, um, 
you know, all of my teammates would probably live in the, the category of, of role models. I mean, I, I needed them to get better. Um, I mean, one of my favorite teammates, Heather O'Reilly, like literally before uh, training sessions, she would look at me and go, do you think we should black out today out of exhaustion? And I'm like, yeah, I think we should black out today. <laughs> so yeah, I had some, I had some really cool um, people to help me and guide me to give me the foundational elements to be able to do the soccer, you know, when I was able to do the soccer. Okay, similar to Alexa's story with the pictures, I have a picture. Um, please don't take this the wrong way, but I met you 2016 World Cup in the hotel. Uh -oh. We're in the elevator, and this is, this is me in the corner, and that's you. So you're, you're in there, trust me. Uh, but anyway. <laughs> Hold on. Did I know that you took the picture, or are you just freaking Absolutely out not. silent? Absolutely not. Uh -huh. I snuck it. <laughs> I snuck it. That's so um, good. But anyway, so I have a little backstory behind my question. Um, I'm only I'm one of three women in my sports media class, mm. and it's all guys, taught by a male professor. So today in class, he we're talking about professional leagues in America and also Europe. And in his PowerPoint, he only had only W, not even WNBA, no WPSL, all male professional sports leagues. So I, I mentioned, I was like, where is the women's sports leagues? So my question would be, what would it take to make women's sports more popular? Because even something just me learning in class, like that's that should be on the board. If you think about it, it should be. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm sure you know this statistic, but only 4% of all sports journalism is dedicated to women's sports. Um, the amount of times that I would pick up a New York Times or USA Today and I would get the sports section, the amount of times that I did that and uh, searched for a, a female's name um, just once in this pages, you know, 10 pages worth of, of sports stories and statistics, the whole thing. The amount of times that I never saw one single female name in the entirety of the sports section um, is countless. And I think that when, when, when you go back to this class, right, I right. think before you ask why there aren't women's sports being taught, right, I think that you have to critically think about um, why there aren't enough journalists and or media companies um, to write the stories right. to get the media attention that it deserves, um, you know, and I like to talk about it from a longer perspective, right? So let's talk about sports over a hundred year period. And people say, right, like the NFL is one of the most popular sports, um, major league sports in our country. And, um, and you think about how many dollars each of these separate franchises has spent over the hundred years or however long these teams have been inception. I mean, we're talking about trillions and trillions of dollars. And so from a perspective of, of time, women's sports is fairly new, right? Right. And um, the problem with this, because so many folks say, well, you know, the reason why men's sports is written about more is because it's more popular, more people watch it, there's more money being put into it. And that on the face of it is true. But when you really dig deeply into the true financials, let's just talk about women's soccer national team. Um, our women's national team from 2015 to present day has actually made more money than our men's national team for the United States Soccer Federation. And they get paid far less, they get far less media impressions and so it's just it's just straight up sexism, like sexism 101. Um, but what we don't realize and understand is that though this hundred year period that I'm talking about, this mark, these marketing dollars, the compounding of you know getting a lifelong fan and that fan teaching the fandom to their child, and it becomes the the, the breath of families, right? It becomes the importance of a family, like being an Eagles fan, for instance, or a Yankees fan. 
the amount of money that goes into it is predicated on the potential for rise. And that investment, that initial investment is never made for the women's game. It is never even close to equal. So we're talking, if we really wanna talk about it, we have to actually get into the nitty gritty of it. And the nitty gritty shows time after time after time is that they don't think, people don't think, companies don't think that women uh, can be as entertaining as men at playing sport. Our women's soccer team is the classic example of that not being the case. Our women's national team is more popular than our men's national team. By the way, we win, sorry, but we do. Um, and, and by the way, we also uh, earn less money than our men's national team players. So at the end of the day, I could go on all day, so I'll stop here. I think that the question is really important. And what's more important to me is that you all critically think about why um, rather than just just accepting things being the way they are. Well, this is just the way it is. This is the way it's always been and this is the way it is. We have to critically think about why things are the way they are and start unlearning some of these sexist belief systems that we all have been made to believe true about our own selves, right? Like I have to look at myself in the mirror sometimes and be like, oh, hell no, this is bull. Like, I can't take this. I gotta, I gotta fix this. I gotta fix the way that I'm thinking about this, even myself. I'm like the wokest woke feminist that's, that ever woke, right? Walking around the world. And I still sometimes have to like school my own self, like out of my own sexist thoughts, because that is how it works. That is how power works. They like, they hammer home these ideas inside of all of us. Men too, by the way, this is not just women that need to unlearn it. Men too have to unlearn it in order for us to actually get what is ours. Great question. Thank you. Oh, was this? Okay. Um, so I don't have a picture, unfortunately. <laughs> That's okay. Um, and is that a tough question to follow? But my initial question was going to be, were you always aspiring to play this level of soccer or if it just kind of ended up that way? But on top of that, just with off of what you said, I've always admired female athletes because they're playing because they love the game. Mm -hmm. It's not, you know, I'm gonna make millions of dollars when I do this. I'm not gonna be famous. It's, I love this game. I like to challenge myself and mm -hmm. that's why I'm doing it. So I always really admired that. And also the women who play till they're 30 and give birth twice. I don't know how you all do that because I'm 21 I'm falling apart. Yeah, I hear you, <laughs> okay. So before I get into yeah. your first question, I just want to challenge you a little bit on what you just said, because I think that that is a misconception and a belief system that I myself shared for many years that I just really, because I was a woman in a, in a position that I wasn't going to be making millions of dollars like the men, that I had to make it right for myself. That I, like I, because of the injustice that I had to make it right for myself. So what I said to myself was, well, at least I do it for the love of the game, right? And I think that that is a little bit of sexism, like internalized sexism, because the truth is every person deserves to make what the, and, and earn what they are their due and what they deserve. Um, and so I think that thinking about the quote unquote love of the game, women are taught to be quiet. Women are taught to be less ambitious because we've been given this small slice, this like little lane of women's sport. And because the only way it makes us feel real good about ourselves is because, oh, we do it for the love of the game. F that, like be ambitious. Like, no, I want to do this because I want to secure money for my family long-term for forever right? Like, by the way, those NBA guys, they're doing it for the love of the game and also making a crap ton of money because, it, it, you know, nobody's going to say no to that. It, they don't, they don't play the game different. This is, this is the, this is the um, belief that, that those in power want you to believe, you know, it's the same thing with, 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 um, college football, right? Like these guys are making these colleges billions and billions of dollars and they're being made on the backs of these college athletes. These college athletes aren't making any money. Then they get hurt and then they can never go play in the NFL. So 
back to the first part of your question, you know, when I was playing, I didn't know, like women's sports hadn't really like blown up really. Um, the 1999 Women's World Cup happened and I was 19 years old and I thought, that's cool, I wanna do that. So what I like to call it is trends and forces. I was just, I happened to be doing something for long enough. I happened to be good enough at it for a long enough period of time that all of a sudden the trends and forces of culture in our world made it so that what the thing that I was doing actually came, became popular. And um, I was able to make the national team in my very first game, I made $2,500 and I thought I was the richest rich that ever riched in the whole lands, um, which is hilarious because that, you know, thinking back now, I'm like, oh, I should have saved all that money, right? Um, but the truth is, is, you know, if you do something long enough, you're going to get real good at it. Um, doesn't mean you're going to be an expert. Doesn't mean you're going to play on the national team, but you will learn a, a hell of a lot of stuff when you do something long enough. I was actually talking to a friend of mine recently. She's a famous uh, actor in Hollywood. I think you guys know her, Amy Poehler. She's amazing. And somebody asked her a question, how do you... Like, what do you attribute your success to? And she's like, honestly, I just like never went away. There are so many parts and in, in things in your life that are going to like make you question, should I be here? Should I quit? Do I belong? And she just said, I just like, I never, I never listened to all the people that like told me that I should quit or I never listened to the messages because I just loved doing what I did. And it wasn't for the fame. It's just, and then I just like started to, to do really well because I just like never gave up. And I know that that's super cliche, but like, I think that there's something to it. Like if you really enjoy doing something and you can make some living out of it, like you might, you might be able to make it something and maybe the trends and forces will work in your way, in your direction. Good question. I actually have a question in the chat uh, from a Manhattan College alumni uh, and her prospective, uh, her daughter is a prospective student uh, here at Manhattan College, so hoping to come here. Um, her question is, how, well, first she said that she just finished reading uh, Untamed and Action Wolfpack is her next book to read. So um, her question is, how can women's sports overcome decisions like this? Federal judge dismisses U.S. women's soccer team equal pay claim. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. I don't know, you know, I don't know if um, you guys know anything about women, but uh, in the history of the world, we women, we haven't been like, oh, all right, you're right. We're just going to stop trying. Like, you are right. We don't deserve to make the same amount as men. That is truth. Like, no, like, it doesn't matter if a judge throws out this lawsuit that our women's national team filed against the U S soccer federation. Um, it just means that we need to keep fighting. It just means that we need to regroup. It means that unfortunately it means that the women will likely have to go to Tokyo next summer and win to prove yet again, that they deserve to be paid more, at least equal, if not more, because I think there's an argument to be paid to be made to, for them to be paid more than the men. Um, if you want to talk about like apples and apples, like it actually, that's the, the science and the math behind it. Um, but yeah, no, no person, no minority in the world um, has ever just been like, yeah, you guys, you, you white men, you're right. Like you are right. I'm going to stop fighting for these social justice issues because I believe you like, no, that's never, that's a never going to happen. Um, and B for our women's national team. I know them. Uh, I know the culture and I know they're just going to keep fighting until we do get the result that we deserve. Ladies, do y'all have any other questions um, before I go to the chat again? I actually have one more. Um, so this is in regards to your 2018 Barnard speech, which, by the way, was amazing. I shed a tear, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> if anyone hasn't seen it, definitely, definitely watch it. I YouTube it. Um, but you talked a lot about 
women having a seat at the table, more of like taking their seat at the table. And what would your best advice be for women, girls in sports, anything, even anyone who's just trying to get their voices heard, trying to find their voice? Yeah. I think that this is the mo one of the most important questions I get asked because there are so many different answers to it. Um, because my experience is different than all y'all's, right? So I, my experience, especially at the end of my career, you know, I was getting offered um, seats at tables and I was tokenized the one, right? I was the, the, the woman that they would let into the room um, to meet with, with high ranking business, business people, mostly men. Um, to, to offer seats at board tables. I have been that token person. Um, and in the book, you know, I talk about how, you know, Ava DuVernay, she, she has an amazing quote. She's like, y'all are over there trying to break through glass ceiling of a house that I never built, that, that women never built. She's like, I'm actually over here building my own house. And the tricky business that we're in as marginalized folks, um, is this idea of not having built the structure that we're all living in and trying to conform and break through ceilings and get offered seats. You know, there's a misconception that, that many women have implanted inside of them. And it's not a fault of our own. It's just the way that the world has operated. And that misconce misconception is that a table of 10 seats that two, only two are offered to women. So what happens is women start fighting against each other for those two seats. Right. Rather than remembering, there are 10 effing seats at the table, right? At least five of them should be given to women. Uh, and so, you know, like Shirley Chisholm has said, bring folding chairs um, for y'all out there trying to find your way in the room. Um, I get it for you out there who are trying to find a, a seat at the table or, or to get a meeting with somebody that you want to have a meeting with, you have to unlearn some of these lies that you were told as a young girl, what it means to be a girl in order to operate inside of the world that we live in, right? This whole, and the reason why I, I love the idea of flipping the fairy tale notion, you know, little red riding hood marches out through the woods. And, uh, you know, as long as she stays in the path, then everything will be fine. But no, like once she gets a little bit curious and goes off the path and the big bad wolf will come and eat her. And that is a lie. That is a lie that power tries to teach us women to stay in line because nothing is worse than dealing with women that are pissed off. Right? So get off, unlearn some of the shit that you were told as a child of what it means to be a woman, keep your humanity. Cause I think that our world needs a little bit of feminine energy, a little bit of feminine leadership right now Amen. to fix so much of what's going on. Um, and embrace that part of yourself. I think that that's why being in the women's national team environment for so many years was so intoxicating to me is because we embraced um, that feminine form of leadership. We could still be hard. We could still be mean to each other. We can still be like competitive as hell and ambitious, but we always had that, um, that feminine energy that in the end, we didn't have to agree on everything, but we, in the end agreed, right. As a, as a collective unit. So I don't know what your question was, but I think I answered a bunch of them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna hop in with another uh, question that I had for you. Um, yeah. A lot of my friends and I are seniors and we're kind of at like a crossroads in our life. Like we're not really sure where to go afterwards. And it's such like an uncertain time right now and we're all like super stressed. So I kind of just wanted to ask like how you felt after graduating and like how, like how you think like our, I guess like fear of the unknown can be kind of eased. Yeah. Well, I think that you guys are facing what what everybody in the world is is probably saying like a double whammy like you're you're leaving school and then this whole covid pandemic thing you know is happening and the truth is you know i am a firm believer of making your environment what it is right like yes this sucks but like 
when I was running sprints with my teammates, like that also sucked, but it felt a little bit better knowing that they were running them too, right? Like this sucks for all of us. This is not easier for some people than others. Like this just straight up sucks for everybody. And I am trying to look for all the moments in my life and all the places in my life that I can take my power back because both things can be true at the same time. This can suck. And what happens after your senior year is over um, is still in your hands. Like you get to still decide how that goes. Like, yes, there's a lot of stuff that might not be totally in your control, but you always get to, to, to decide how you respond. So you can spend the next nine months or however long it takes for you guys to get through your senior year. You can spend the next nine months off complaining and focusing only on what you can't be doing or what you can't have or how much harder it is now. Or you can look ahead and say, okay, this is a bizarre situation that is forcing us to pivot, business word, and is forcing me to figure out a new way. So what are you doing, in fact, to get ready for that next step? Are you preparing yourself? Are you, um, I know you're learning and trying to figure out and, and, and finals and, and, and your major and trying to sort out all your credits. I know that all of that is confusing, but like, what are you doing internally? Because we have all these different things going on all the time at, at the same time, right? So we have these internal worlds and then we have these external worlds. Like, have you done any internalized work during this time for um, you know, racial justice? Have you been doing any internalized work for yourself um, with slowing down and not being able to go do things? Like these are pose these are challenges. And some people are meeting these challenges head on, and some people are not. And by the way, like I have Netflixed more in the last six months than the history of all Netflix, I think I've, I've gotten you all beat. So I definitely have some things that I need to be working on, but I do know that I've also been doing quite a bit of internal work and there will probably never be another time in your life ever. And maybe even history of humanity that, that we would be able to, or get to experience this great pause of to figure out what to do next. And, you know, I don't know what your guys' family situations are, but if you if you um, have an ability to break the tie right now and like cut that that cord between you and your parents and rely on yourself, you will be a much better human being in 10, 15, 20 years. I guarantee it. Do not look back and, and ask for help from your parents unless like, you know, things are really bad and you do need your parents help but like don't do it just out of like comfort like this is the time that you get to try new things and if you aren't feeling a little uncomfortable right now then you might be doing something a little bit wrong during this time i think so yeah different ways of perspective of looking at it Gemma, go did you have a question oh, i actually wasn't raising my hand but i do have another question um it's kind of uh, about your retirement, how has it affected you negatively or positively from the soccer standpoint and trying to find your career? Yeah, so, you know, I've, I've been tooting my own horn quite a bit during this talk, so I'm going to get, like, real, real with you. At the end of my career, um, I was really suffering because I didn't do enough of the work, Alexa, that I was just talking about. Oh, my gosh, my Alexa. That must annoy you so much. I'm sorry. I get it all the time. It's fine. I'm used to yeah. it. So um, I, I was suffering so much because I didn't know what I was going to do after my career ended. I really didn't. And um, so I was drinking too much and found myself um, behind the wheel of a car after having golfed all day with friends. Um, and I ended up getting pulled over and got a DUI. And what felt like... I don't know. It was, it was the worst night of my life for sure. Um, 
I was hoping, because you guys might not know this about me, my official first name is Mary. So I was hoping like hell that the media wouldn't pick it up and that just didn't happen. The media picked it up and it, it went across t t uh, the ESPN ticker for about a week. Um, I've never been more embarrassed, but, but what you all don't understand is I was really suffering with um, some alcoholism issues, um, trying to self-medicate through the end of my career, trying to self-medicate through some depression and anxiety that I was experiencing, some mental health stuff that I was going through. <clears throat> Not to excuse the DUI because I was stupid and I'm an idiot for doing that. Um, and I remember calling my mom from jail. I was 30, when was this? I was 36 years old. And I, like a, like a, like a child, I called my mom from jail. And not like she could do anything about it because she was in New York and I was in Portland, Oregon. And I was crying and I said, my life is over. I've ruined everything that I've just built. Um, I've just spent a, a near perfect, like brand building um, career as an athlete. And I've just, just gone and blown it all away. Um, and my mom said something that I'll never forget. And she said, listen, this sucks. This is the worst thing that I'm sure you've ever felt. She said, but I know you and I know that you always do the right thing in the end and you'll make this right. So that was over four years ago, almost five now. And I have, I have not had another drink since that night, which is amazing. So I'm over four years sober. Um, and the reason why I'm telling you this story is because, you know, you don't learn anything in life. You don't get to the level of success that I have been able to achieve in my life without having some pretty brutal rock bottoms um, and moments where I felt like I completely ruined it all. So when those moments happen, because they do, it's not if, it's when those moments happen in your life, how are you going to respond to it, right? Are you going to let this moment crumble you and ruin your life? Or are you going to try to learn as much as you can about whatever the hell it is that got you here so that you don't replicate it. Right. Um, and so, you know, the thing that I'm most proud of in this story, um, obviously my sobriety is so important to me. Um, but the thing that I'm most proud of is that I never, I never separated from my integrity throughout it all, even though I wasn't, living completely in my integrity as uh, an abuser of alcohol and prescription pain meds, um, I was still able to like make the choice that lined up with honor inside of my character. Um, and we all have that, even in the worst of moments, even in jail. Like if one of you finds yourself in jail, and I'm sure some of you will, um, you know, not only is it humbling, but like you get a chance to fix it. And I think that that's a really important lesson just in general for life, because we're all going to make so many, I'm going to make tons of more mistakes, hopefully not as severe as that one. Um, but I know that, that, that mistakes can be made and they also can be made good. You can make good on some of the mistakes that you do make. Great. Thanks so much, Abby. Um, I, I want to get to one of the questions in the chat, and then we'll go back. We'll come back to Sydney. Um, so one of the questions in the chat says, how do you think news like the Brazilian Federation starting to pay both the men and women equally will impact women's football worldwide? Can you read the first part, the Brazilian news, did you say? Yes. How do you think news like the Brazilian Federation starting to pay both the men and women equally will impact women's football worldwide. worldwide. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think this is a really great question because it's a really good start. Um, the Brazilian women's soccer team, uh, the Brazilian Soccer Federation is paying their women's team the same as they pay their men. Um, I think the English women's national, the English national team as well, um, they're gonna pay both their men and women's teams the same. But there's a, there's a caveat to this. As, as there are always when we talk about the difference between men and women and the pay equity conversation. Um, and what the asterisk says in, in the fine print is that they're going to pay their women's teams 
proportionally for major tournaments, the Olympics and the World Cup. Now, what that means is um, when the men, when FIFA, which is the governing body of all of world football, when FIFA puts together these tournaments, the men's tournament and the women's tournament, they put together packages, uh, prize packages for the winners. Um, for the men's winning team, I think the last, uh, the last World Cup's winners made the team won $40 million, $40 million for winning the men's World Cup. And our women's national team who won the World Cup in 2019, I think that the, the prize money was $2 million, right? So here we talk about proportion. Uh, and this is really what um, our, the men around the world make most of their money playing for their club teams, not their national teams. And for the women's, it's a little bit opposite. And hopefully that changes over the years. But for right now, for women to earn a, a living wage, um, it's about trying to get to these big corporations and institutions that fund FIFA that say, OK, you are, your sponsorship is actually um, sexism and it's sexist and by its nature in terms of the way that those dollars then get spent through FIFA. Um, so yeah, though that this is a, a huge step, um, I think that we are still a far cry from calling it true pay equity and pay equality. Um, so just know that, uh, just know that, you know, and, and the big argument, right? The big argument that I hear and I heard throughout my whole career is that the, the men bring in more than the women. So of course the men should earn more. This is a capitalist country. I, I, I understand logically that, that the concept of that argument. Um, however, like I said earlier, you know, from 2015 to now, our women's national team has actually earned more money than our men's national team from winning championships and for U.S. Soccer Federation. So if you want to have that argument, let's have that argument and actually pay the women better, pay the women more than the men, um, and see how they like it. But guess what? That's not what we're asking for. The women don't want to be paid more than the men because you don't want to use the same tools of the oppressor that they've pressed you with, right? Like you want what's fair and equal. Um, and truly it's just the, the world gets run by big corporations like FIFA and the IOC, the Olympic, the Olympic committee. So. Sydney. Sydney. Yeah. Um, this more had to do with the last topic, but I was just wondering when rock bottom hits and you're in the aftermath of it, what gets you through it day by day? Oof. And yeah, that's <laughs> it. That's... Like literally that is it. It's the day by day. So um, in AA, they call it one day at a time. And it's so frustrating because you know, I just want to know five years down the road, I want to know, like, what is this? Is this going to be worth my time? Right? Like, is this going to be worth the dedication that I continuing that I continually spend on this? Um, this idea of sobriety, and the, the truth is, is, I've had to actually define what sobriety means to me, because there are so many people that don't drink in the world, but they're called what's what's called dry drunks, folks who might not actually literally take in um, alcohol, but their addiction comes out in many different ways. So for me, my definition of sobriety is peace. And um, anybody or thing that comes into my life that tries to take away my peace uh, is threatening my sobriety and I have to fix that problem. You know, the world is gonna send you, like what Oprah would say, the world sends you whispers and if, the, if, if you don't hear the whispers of life, then life will throw a brick in your face. Um, and, and for me, it's like every day and, and the longer this goes on, like, just so you know, and I don't know, I'm sure some of you probably are dealing with some sort of, um, you know, addiction on some level, the longer I get into my own sobriety and peace, the more I truly understand, um, that, that my self-medication measures were about the fear of finding out who I am and this fear of 
like the other side of that mirror, like what if nothing is there? I thought for most of my life, like I am nothing, right? I am nothing without soccer. Uh, this soccer identity I put on, this athlete identity I put on, like what if I like start stripping away all these identities that I have for myself? Who am I then? Like take away student, take away soccer player, take away red hair, take away all of the things about yourself, like and who are you? And the older I get and the more mature I get in my sobriety, the more I understand that I am perfect just the way that I am. And I don't need to alter anything about myself, not my, not my looks, not my, um, you know, insides. Like right now, who I am is perfectly just the way I am. Um, because all of this, ah, it's like the rat race, like trying to keep up with the Joneses and have the cool thing and have the cool watch and keep my hair cool. And like all this shit, that's just not, it doesn't matter. It really just does not matter. Like when you get older and you start making decisions for your life, like what you do for a living and what kind of work you want to put your time towards, like what, what will wake you up in the morning has to be something that is lifelong, right? It's not like a job. Like nobody wakes up for a job. Like you wake up because you want to do work. You want to be a contributor of life, of the world, of whatever it is. Like you might have children or you might have this beautiful job that you adore. Like whatever it is, like those are anything that you put on in the end. As you get older, you learn that none of those identities are who you are. And all of the suffering that you have chosen, because suffering is optional, all of the suffering is by trying to please or like create this external idea of what you thought you were supposed to be doing or looking like or feeling like at this time. Like, I don't know, I could go on all day about this, because especially women, like we put so much pressure on ourselves to be perfect and to be, for me, it was to be an athlete, but like, what happens when that goes away? Like, who are you? What happens when you f up? Like, what happens when you mess up bigger than you've ever messed up? Like, your life will go on. You just have to figure out a way to do that. Sorry, I, I F-bombed, but like, it just, it's an important enough word, I think, for certain sentences to accentuate the importance of it. <laughs> No, no problem. Thanks so much. Um, we have time for like two more questions. Uh, so I'm going to go to the chat uh, and ask a question from the chat. Uh, one question is, do you remember the first time someone asked you for your autograph or recognized you out in public? Ooh, this is good. Okay. So <clears throat> when I first uh, became a professional athlete, it was in 2002. Um, and I got drafted number two, not one, by the way, I got drafted number two out of University of Florida to go play for the team called the Washington Freedom at the time. And I don't know if you guys have heard of this player, but her name is Mia Hamm. Have you ever heard of her? Right. So Mia was on this team. So I was so terrified because and excited. I was excited to go play with her, but I was more scared, I think, at the time because I did. I like I wanted to have said that I played with her, but I didn't want to like actually experience it because I was so nervous and terrified of her. But we became teammates and um, our very first game, my parents came to the game and my very first uh, professional sports game. We were in RFK Stadium in Washington, D.C. And my mom said, if we see anybody to my dad, if we see anybody like with a Wombach jersey on, like, let's 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 find them and we're going to give them a, a ticket. They bought like an extra ticket to the game and we're going to take them, that person with us back backstage to meet Abby, you know, after the game or whatever. So lo and behold, we do the game. I don't even remember the outcome of the game. And I go to meet my parents um, right by the locker rooms after the game. And they have like this total stranger next to them. I'm like, mom, dad, like, oh my gosh, I'm a professional. I'm like so excited. They're like, yeah, this is Jody. And I just, we just wanted you to know that Jody is your first ever fan. And I was like, what are you talking about? They're like, she was the only one with your, your, the jer with your name on the back of her Jersey. And we just, we needed to bring her to meet you to get an autograph. So my parents literally forced this first autograph situation 
in my life. It's like it's like the, the the comedy story that they love to tell. Like, oh yeah, Abby's very first professional game. Like, there was only one fan of hers there, <laughs> out of thousands of people. So yeah. Can I have one last question. Uh, go ahead, Alex. That's fine. This will be the last question. Um, we're gonna ask another one in the chat, but. You well, can, no, 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 Alexa, you go and then Deanna go. All right, thank you. Um, you just spent like the last hour giving us like amazing advice and like such inspirational, like things that obviously we'll all take back. But I just want to know like what's the best piece of advice that you've ever been given? Okay, so here's the thing. Like I, nothing that I say is advice. Like it's a story. It's like, I hope that you can see yourself in some of my story. Like that's my hope, that's my dream. But if you want to understand how like true success works, um, the most basic equation I can give you is to always find elements of leveling up in every circumstance, right? Um, I was I was I was an obsessive athlete like I treated my body like it it was a machine because it was for many years. And if you look at the the complexity of the human body, there are so many elements that go into whether or not you're going to have a good training session that next day, that next second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day. So there's so many little things that you have to do and so we call them percentage points of gains, so making gains. And I was so methodical and, and specific about doing everything, like literally not having another thing I could cross off to make a gain so that when I was going back on that field the next day, my body hadn't just recovered. Like I've recovered and come above that line so that I can be even better. So my, what I would tell you is that there are always ways to make gains and level up. Uh, and if you find yourself looking around uh, at what other people are doing to level up, you've got it wrong. Like the reason why I'm, I found success is because I was creative and nuanced and innovative and made choices, made mistakes. Um, don't get me wrong. Like I did some really weird crap, you know, that didn't work <laughs> like weird you know, nowadays it's awesome. Like cryotherapy early on, like nobody knew all the science behind it and ice and cold plunge, like all, I did everything. But no matter what situation I was in, I always wanted to be in a harder situation. So uh, as a kid, I was playing soccer against boys. Um, and and so that was like a way that I was like pushing myself, leveling up. And part of that was like my parents wanting to like challenge me. And then, you know, I was on the high school team in, in seventh and eighth grade, which was leveling up. And then when I got into high school, I was playing on a semi-professional team so that I could just be training with really good, better players. Like I was always putting myself in uncomfortable positions of not being the best, right? And almost in some ways being the worst. Like. I remember my first national team practice, I was like deer in, a head, deer in headlights. I was like, this is not for me. These people are actual athletes and I am a peon. I should not be here, I'm terrible. And then, you know, I go to bed and I wake up and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna just try this again. And I wouldn't be scared to be the worst um, because as you level up, there's a period of transition that needs to happen that you are going to be poor. You're not going to be the best. You're not going to be making the most money. You're going to be an intern. You're going to be like, nobody's going to pay attention to you. Everybody's going to think that you don't even belong there. And the only thing that allows you to continually level up through your life is to truly wholeheartedly believe that you can level up, that you will eventually find your way. Um, and nobody could ever take that from me, right? So confidence, they say coaches can take confidence, but I never gave my confidence away. I never gave my confidence to a coach or another athlete. I always held on to that. Um, but like I said, like that doesn't mean your confidence doesn't get challenged. 
that doesn't mean you don't question some of the decisions that you made or you make. Um, but leveling up is the surefire way of ending up where you want to go. It's not going to be easy. You're going to be, it's going to be challenging. Um, nobody ever made it to a successful place in their life without hardship or trying to level up. So that's what I would say. Level up. Who is it? It's a uh, Ciara. Level up, level up, level up, level up. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Um, so we have one, we have time for one last question. Uh, it comes from Emily uh, in the chat. It says, you write in Wolfpack that you need to figure out how to lead regardless of your position on the team. How did you transition from being a leader in the field to being a leader in your retirement? Yeah. I think it kind of piggybacks on the question that you just answered. Yeah. Well, listen, I think one of the most foundational things, one of the most impactful things that ever happened in my career uh, was in 2015 when we were playing in the World Cup in Canada and I was 35. This is like the end of my career, um, you know, and at 35 years old, like I was slow as hell. I, there was no reason why I could have been playing 120 minutes. Like 35 year olds don't play that many minutes. Um, and, and our coaching staff sat me down and they basically um, decided that I was going to come off, uh, come off the bench at the end of games to help secure uh, a lead or push for a goal uh, at the end of that tournament. And let me tell you, like, I was so devastated. I was so devastated because, you know, I have a healthy ego on my shoulders. I, I had imagined this, this tournament going totally different. Um, and here I was being confronted with literally, I, I got my bench, like the coaching staff benched me, like, how am I going to handle this? And I decided I had two choices. I could be a good teammate or a bad teammate. Um, and let me tell you, like with my sadness and, and, and um, upsetness over this decision, I like, I actually played out both of those scenarios, like all the way to the end. Um, like I said, I had a healthy e ego on, on my shoulders, but the truth is, is like, I had yet to win a world cup. Um, and this is the decision that was being made. And I knew that the only way at this point I was going to be able to help my team is if I chose the good teammate path. So you, you may know this now. I don't know. Um, I'm the pretty competitive. So I wanted to be the best bench player that I ever could be. Um, and I think making that choice, in fact, I know making that choice, uh, gave me an understanding, a deeper understanding of what real leadership was. It allowed me access to philosophy about leadership that I had never learned before. And the only way I would have learned it was sitting right there on that bench. Um, it gave me clout, for lack of a better word, when it comes to this conversation about leadership. It gave me this beautiful story to talk about in that Barnard speech that you talked about, Gemma, that gave me material for this Wolfpack book that has allowed me to go on the road and become this public speaker that I never knew that that was even possible. None of that, none of this is happening without me deciding for whatever reason that being on that bench, I was going to make it the best thing that ever happened. And I don't know. It just, it, it w rounded out my ability to see the collective difficulties of being a true leader on a team like our women's national team. Um, I'm proud of the way that I responded because in the end, like, and I think about this a lot now in my retirement, in the end, it's not about, it's not even about the championships. <laughs> it's like, it's like, how did your teammates feel about you? That is what the, what matters. Like when I text some of my former teammates and when they text me, they're not asking like, hey, like I ran six miles today. How fast did you run them in? They're like, dude, I cheated on my husband and I'm suffering. They're like, dude, I need you. I need your help. And they learned that they could count on me then when I got my benched they learned that they can call on me to show up no matter what 
And that's the stuff that I take away. It's so silly. I've like literally given my own self the chills. Um, <laughs> that's the stuff that can never be taken away from me. Those choices that I look back on and am so proud of, and those choices that I look back on, and I like when my kids start giving me attitude, I'm like, turn on the 2015 Women's World Cup final. Turn it on, and we're going to watch it. And you're going to see your mom sitting on the bench, okay? And you're going to see how she's responding to the situation. And then we're going to rethink this little classroom problem that you're having. We're going to rethink, we're going to rethink it. So yeah, I just think that sometimes life is going to present you with difficult decisions to make and you can rise to the decision that you know in your truth and in your integrity and character, what is the right one. Um, everybody knows what the right decision is. It's just people don't want to actually do it. They don't want to do the hard stuff that takes effort. They don't want to do the hard stuff that sometimes don't, doesn't feel completely right. It didn't feel completely right for me to sit on the bench. But like, look at me years later, I've made so much more money by being a professional speaker because I sat on that bench than I did ever playing women's soccer. Like for reals, like for me, that's just like, oh, okay. So that was a good choice. That was a good choice. Thank you so much, Abby. Like this was totally 100% like awesome. Like I think each and every student, parent that is joined in tonight has gotten something from this. Um, thank you for your time. Like we are so humbly grateful that you took out time in your day to come and speak with us. Um, everyone who joined tonight, thank you so much from student engagement. We are extremely happy that you guys took some time with us. Abby, thank you again. We cannot thank you so much. Um, you are a Jasper now. So <laughs> thank you so much. We appreciate it. Deanna, Good night, Gemma, everyone. Sydney, and Alexa, <laughs> thank you guys so much. Thank you, Great Abby. Questions. Thank you so much. Bye. <laughs> All right. See you guys. Good night, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye. Sorry for the F words. <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> Bye, Abby.